Exodus chapter 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is the word of God for us tonight. Looking at verse 17, this is the word of God. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness towards the Red Sea. Look again. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness towards the Red Sea. For the time we're desiring tonight, as we again are sharing in the Soul Renewal Revival, I want to preach from this thought tonight. I want to talk about I had to go through it. Turn to someone next to you say, neighbor, you had to go through it. Lift those hands toward heaven and say, Lord, speak. We need to hear. You may be seated in the presence of God. I, like your pastor, am a nerd. Certain books, titles grab my attention. Not too long ago, I ran across a book that I was intrigued simply based on the title. The title was book it was called The Mystery of God. The author's Borean Hall raised this interesting book. If you ever get an opportunity from a theological perspective, it raises some critical questions for us to consider. One of the major things that it deals with, and you can surmise based upon the title of the book, that it deals with this whole notion of the mystery of God. It raises a couple questions. Number one, the incomprehensibility of God. How do we deal with a God that is difficult to know? And in that way, they also raised the second portion where they suggested that how can we navigate a God that every time we think we know him, he always changes and shifts his position. And they raised it from a theological discourse. I will admit to you that as I read the book, I, my heart, my mind, and my spirit began to find truth in the book because I know perhaps you're more saved than I, but I oftentimes struggle trying to figure out, God, why do you do the things that you do? On one hand, to deal with the incomprehensibility of God, this God that the Bible even says his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And I struggle and I love God and I serve God, but there are times where I find myself yearning to want to know God more. But in my wanting to know God more, it oftentimes come to this conclusion, I know God even less. When you think about that, when you think about the unknowingness of God, it raises reverence and humility. Reverence on one hand, where we admire his presence, but humility on the other, when we're trying to navigate his practices. There is a difference tonight, child of God, because for all of us, we oftentimes want to get to know God more, but in essence, we'll never truly know him, but sometimes we are forced to just trust him even when we can't trace him. That's life for some of us tonight. I can sense in the spirit realm here tonight that there are those who hear. There are some things that you have been wrestling with. And here you are trying to make sense of why God is allowing certain things to happen. Some of us come to church uh, with pain and problems, proclivities, and all kind of issues. And here you are loving God. But there are moments you're thinking, God, do you really know what you're doing? And I want to submit tonight that oftentimes God is never found. He's always revealed because it is through situations that he reveals himself to our lives. Matter of fact, you would not know he's a healer unless you've been sick. You would not know he can provide unless you've had lack. God moves in an interesting way. And I will admit to you there's some troubling theological passages of scripture and one that we ring in church. We shout, but I oftentimes struggle with, for we know all things work together for the good of those who love. I struggle with that all things because uh, there are moments, my brothers and sisters, there's sometimes I feel like God does some unnecessary stuff in order for us to understand who he is. I know I'm pushing your spiritual implications tonight. And Pointer, I know that those who always want to say that God knows best, and I feel you, I'm rocking with you, but there are some moments, there are some situations in hindsight uh, that there are some unnecessary things that God does in my life. Uh, and even though they are unnecessary, on the other side, I realize they were really needed. I don't know who I come to preach to tonight, but that's my simple aim. That's my takeaway truth in the words of your pastor. I want you to know that God will do some unnecessary necessary stuff in order to reveal himself so that you will know who he really is that's the aim of this revival that there are circumstances and situations that God will do and sometimes it don't make sense why you're going through it but at the end of going through it God exposes who he really is 
that, that's what is the, the, the text of this, of this passage tonight. It, it brings us to what I know many of you, uh, you already know this story. We're talking about when the children of Israel uh, are now commissioned to cross through the Red Sea. You know the story about all that has transpired in the history of Israel. You've seen uh, how they were on top in the book of Genesis under the patriarch and under the leadership of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But you know the shift that occurs in Exodus when things change. There was a, a Pharaoh that did not know who Joseph was. And now we find the children of Israel uh, who were now kings and queens now moving to be slaves in captivity. That's the story of Egypt. For 450 years, uh, they were struggling. And so much were they struggling uh, that they were not at, able to keep up with their worship to Almighty God. God looked at their predicament. He figured out, I need to free them and liberate them so they can honor me with who they really are. And so he raised up a stuttering fugitive by the name of Moses, had a conversation with him on the backside of Midian where a bush that was burning but not consuming. In that moment, he sends Moses on assignment. You got one job, Moses, and that's simply to stand before Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. I love that story. If I had time tonight, if y'all didn't seem so sleepy, I would tell you I appreciate of the assignment that admiration of that moment because notice in his apprehension Moses asked God he says now listen I just can't stand in front of Pharaoh I, I need to know who's sending me and, and he says listen if he asks who it is this is all you need to tell him tell him I am that I am is the one that sent you see y'all don't know when to shout your cousins in Augusta do the same thing because some of you have been always wondering about, about the power and the profundity of God's name that simple I am phrase is an interesting phrase because it's an answer to whatever question you have. Somebody came tonight wondering who's going to deliver me? I am. Who is going to heal my body? I am. Who's going to pay my bills? I am. There's something powerful about the name of God and he told Moses when you stand in front of Pharaoh just tell him I am is the one that's going to handle everything. But, but y'all know the story. You, you know what took place in the passage. He goes before Pharaoh and Pharaoh's heart gets hardened. And so what we see is this round 10 by 10 fight, an issue that goes back and forth. is God versus Pharaoh. There's all kind of plagues until the final plague occurs. You know that story. God says, I'm tired of going back and forth with Pharaoh. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take what belongs to me. And, and, and I'm going to take the firstborn of your children and your lifestyle. But Israel, because I love you, this all I'm going to do is I want you to take an unblemished lamb, slit its throat, take the blood, put it over your doorpost, eat the rest of the lamb. And when the deaf angel comes over that night, when it sees the blood, it's going to pass over. That's why, child of God, you ought to be grateful you've been covered. You ought to be thankful that you got a God that passes over. And, and that's how the narrative concludes. They are now liberated. Pharaoh is at his wit's end, tells Moses and Israel, get out of here. They put stuff in their pockets. And the Bible says something intriguing in Exodus chapter 13, uh, that they are on uh, their way to freedom. They're on their way to the promised land. That is what God uh, had given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He had told them about this land flowing with milk and honey they were now on their way to where God wanted them to be but verse 17 and 18 it causes me some tension tonight preachers I will admit to you uh, because if we look at the passage and take it for what it says uh, the Bible says there was a shorter route to get to the promised land there there was a shorter way there was a, a better way if you will there there was a way that could have got them there faster in essence uh, there was a primary option that God could have took the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land uh, but God decided no I'm not going to take them the short route I'm going to take them the long way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Well, the reason I raised that tonight is because Pastor Parks if you really put it in context the Red Sea should have never have happened. I mean there was another way for them to go. It was the primary option that we should have never heard of the Red Sea miracle. We should have never known about them going through the wilderness. We should have never had a time where the waters were parted. That should have never been in the annals of the history of the children of Israel. They should have got out of Egypt and went straight into the promise and but God decided to create an unnecessary miracle God decided to do something that he did not have to do for the all explicit purpose of trying to teach the children of Israel who he really was and I don't know who I come to talk to tonight but I believe there's some people here that's been a recipient of a Red Sea miracle there's some stuff that has taken place in your life and the truth of the matter is you didn't have to go through it God, God had an alternative God had 
had another way to do it, but God saw fit to produce an unnecessary miracle. Why? Because even though it was unnecessary, it was needed for his glory. Every now and again, child of God, God will do that. And I want to talk to someone tonight. I got a simple little premise tonight. And my simple premise is this, is that there must be a reason for my Red Sea miracle. Who am I talking to tonight? Who's interested? Touch your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I, I need to hear this message because Lord knows uh, there's some stuff I wish I didn't have to go through. There's some stuff that I wish I didn't have to encounter. There's some stuff I wish I didn't have to experience. But yet, in our text, God in this pericope shows us that even though it may seem unnecessary, it's going to be for your benefit. That's my aim tonight. Let, let me see what I see in this passage. Number one, I, I believe if we were to take this passage at, at face value, if we were to look at this as, as something they had to go through, even though there was an alternative route, the first thing that I submit to you as we peruse this passage is I submit to you that God allowed a Red Sea miracle, number one, in order to calm their fears. Sometimes, shout of God, God makes you go through stuff. Because God knows what you can handle in your present season. Uh, that, that's why the text is intriguing. Verse 17 uh, outlines that for us. It, that, that when you read it, don't miss uh, um, the, what the text is really saying. There was a shorter route, absolutely. There was an alternative route that could have got them from Egypt to the promised land. But there was a problem. It was going to take them, according to scripture, through Philistine Territory. Don't, don't miss that tonight. Don't. It, it was not a journey that would have been an easy journey. It was shorter, yes, and, and it might have been an a, a, a easier road, yes, but there were some problems in that way. And God began to survey what the children of Israel had experienced for 450 years. And after looking at that, he assumed, he surmised uh, that it would be easier for them to be delayed uh, and to go through a wilderness and Red Sea uh, than to go through a shorter route where there's Philistine territory. How do you say that tonight? Well, I mean, first of all, let's begin to unpack what the Philistine were. They, they, they were seafaring people. They, these, were, these were fighting people. Even at this junction of the history of the world, the Philistines are were known to, to re be real well on the battlefield. They, they could navigate with chariots and spears and swords. They, they were known in antiquity to be people of, of war and not just their tactics but also the terrain that, that this area was really a, a, a level type of area. It, it, was, it was easy for the Philistine army to maneuver. There, there would be no places for them to hide. Uh, uh, Israel would literally be a sitting duck in this Philistine territory. So number one, they couldn't handle the tactics of the enemy. And number two, they couldn't handle the terrain of the enemy. And so what God decided uh, is that because I know what they can handle better than they do, uh, I'm gonna, not going to let them go through something uh, that may end up causing them to turn around uh, and forget how good I've been to them. Uh, in other words, what I'm submitting to you tonight uh, is literally God rejected Israel uh, in order to protect Israel. He told Israel no. Uh, because he knew that this no now would benefit them down the line. And I know some of you don't shout over God's no because you only want to shout over God's yes. But may I tell you tonight that sometimes your biggest blessing is not in God's yes. But sometimes your best blessing is in God's no. Somebody tonight ought to be grateful that God said no. Because if he did not say no, you might be messed up, jacked up on the side of a road somewhere but God knew better than you that he could protect you by rejecting you who am I preaching to tonight that's why child of God I know you had all of the requirements I know tonight that you were overqualified for the job and here you are angry in church tonight because they hired somebody else and you put your mind in it you saw how much more money you can make but God knew that the boss was going to be ignorant and God knew that the co-workers were going to be messy God knew that I can't let you have that job because if you get on that job you're going to lose your faith I hear tonight some student in the house it was your dreams 
school and, and you had filled out all you could. You got all the scholarship money, but they rejected you and, and you're angry and mad because you didn't get in the school of your dreams, but God knew that there was a group on that campus that you was going to get connected to uh, and didn't start doing stuff that you knew you shouldn't be doing. Uh, and by the time you look up, you're expelled from school uh, and now you have debt over your life. God knows uh, how to tell you no. I know there's somebody here tonight. You mad because you invested in him. You dated for a long time. That was your boo and bay. You had already figured out your engagement pictures uh, and you were ready for the wedding. Uh, but here he is. He broke your heart. You're angry and mad. But God knew you weren't really dealing with him. He was dating his representative. God bless you by allowing your heart to be broken because his no is better than his yes. And I know tonight. That's my child of God. God's no is always greater than man's yes. Touch a neighbor next to you and tell him he knows what you can handle. He, he knows the situations that you can are prepared for. He knows. A few weeks ago, um, we commemorated in America one of the darkest days of my life, September the 11th, 2001. If you remember that story, it was three different places, but we mostly remember what happened at the World Trade Center in New York City. That morning where thousands of people lost their life because of a terrorist act on our hands, on our land. And it's interesting because I will admit to you, as horrible as a day that was, there were also certain stories that began to come out about people who did not lose their life for what seemed to be random circumstances. S stuff that didn't make sense. And, and they should have been there at the World Trade Center, but because of random circumstances, they were not there and literally it saved their life. I could tell you tonight there was an individual that the Friday before that Tuesday, she got fired. She was supposed to be there in that place, but she got fired uh, that Friday before. And because she was fired, her life was spared. I could also tell you about an individual of a female who was, had a Brad breakup that weekend so bad uh, that she took some days off from work. She was so in an emotional wreck that she decided not to go and work and it just so happened uh, that that's the week of 9-11. I, I could shout you over those two, but my favorite occurrence happened when a female was driving in uh, to the World Trade Center. She was uh, just a few miles away from the World Trade Center when she looked up in her rearview mirror and she saw something that startled her. She noticed uh, that she had a large stain uh, on her blouse. She said, I cannot go to work like this. She decided to turn around uh, and go home. By the time she goes home uh, and, she, and she looks and turns on the TV, that's when the, the planes came into the World Trade Center. She was lucky uh, that she had a stain on her that forced her to go back home and she missed being in the world trade center i can see some of you asking the same question what was that stain well she found out what the stain was is she had a nosebleed she she had a nosebleed on the way to work that morning and so blood had trickled down her face and got on her clothes the sight of the blood in the rearview mirror is what forced her to turn around and because she was covered in blood her life was saved I wish I had somebody tonight that can lean over to a neighbor and say, neighbor, it's because I was covered. It's because I got covered is why I got spared. Is there anybody here tonight that can look over your life and say, thank God he covered me? Number one, he, he does it to calm our fears. There's something else in passage I would submit to you tonight. Not only does he allow us to go through it through unnecessary miracles, to calm my fears, but number two, I submit to you that he does it to control our focus. <laughs> but this is intriguing because if you keep on with the trajectory of the narrative, text says that once they get out of it, they find themselves in an interesting place called Pi Hahara. Now, this is an interesting place because it is camped between the Red Sea and mountains on both the left and the right side. What makes it interesting about this same time Pharaoh's heart gets rehardened, and he decides that he wants to send his army after the children of Israel. They're not in Pihaharoth, literally they are sitting ducks, they're facing a Red Sea, they got mountains on the left and right, and now 
Can you imagine the confusion in the camp as they're hearing the hooves of the army that is now coming from their rear in order to consume and defeat them? You can imagine they are losing their mind. As you can imagine, this is where they started. They're grumbling and they're complaining. They go to Moses because they find themselves in a dead-end situation. They say, look here now, we are struggling. And the army's behind us. We got mountains we can't climb. On the left and right, we got a sea in front of us that we can't swim across. You done brought us out here to lose our lives. And guess what Moses does? He decides to pray to God. He asks God, what can we do in this moment? And God responds, and this is God's answer to the people's predicament. He tells Moses, tell the people, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Y'all miss what I'm saying. That's why I can tell y'all getting good preaching because none of that stuff wows you. Remember, they're in Pi Hahara. They're facing a Red Sea. They got mountains on their left and right and a raging army come behind them. And this is God's plan to them. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Okay, I'm Baptist. Got to say it three times. They're facing a sea they can't swim across, mountains on their left and right that they can't climb, an army that's coming behind them, and they don't know what in the world to do. They figure their lives is about to end. It's over. They can't, they're either going to drown in the Red Sea, or they're going to fall off the mountain, or this army is going to vanquish them. But when Moses goes to God and tells God what's going on, this is God's strategy and God's plan. Tell the people to stand still and see okay I understand here tonight that, that, that to me I will admit those instructions are, are quite interesting to me tonight Pastor Parks because it's twofold stand still and see uh, this is intriguing. That word stand, I want you to understand that when it's written, it's not written as some passive uh, sit back on your heels type of instruction. Yeah. It's, 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 it's almost giving us the word picture of someone that's, that's, that's telling their tippy toes uh, in anticipation. It's, it's a position of expectation. It's, it's almost as if God said, uh, get on the edge of your seats. Get, get ready to experience something because when I move, I need you to move just like that. I, I'm about to do something and I don't need you uh, uh, being uh, lazy or lazy fair in this moment. I need you uh, to be in the position and posture uh, because you're getting ready to move into another place uh, and I don't need you sitting idly by. I need you to get yourself ready. Uh, I wish I had time tonight because I would tell you uh, is that sometimes you ought to be thankful for the stuff coming after you because uh, it pushes you where God wants you to be. Sometimes shout of God this was not a mission for them to go backwards it was a mission for them to move forward and how many of us look silly because there are times you want to retreat when God said this isn't the season to retreat this is the season to get ready to move forward and where I want you to be stands I don't need you to sit down stand still I need you Make sure you're getting ready because something is about to happen. They'll, that neighbor beside you and tell them you got to be in the position of readiness. That's why some of us can't get something from God. Uh, it's because when God's up to something, you got to be expecting it even before you even see it manifesting. You got to trust God uh, because you can't be worried in this moment. God is about to do something. But he says, stand still and see. The see thing is intriguing to me, Peter Knight. I, I would admit to you this, this notion of seeing is quite intriguing. It's almost as if God was saying that what's going to make this miracle manifest is your ability to perceive what I'm about to do. In other words, you got to make sure your focus is on the right thing. See, um, um, if you keep your eyes on the mountains and on the armies behind you, you're going to miss it because uh, uh, this is not a season for you to focus on your problems. It's the season to focus on your God. It's, it's, it's up to you because if you don't have the right vision, you're going to miss it. I didn't understand this. Last week I was headed to New Jersey. I had to go preach a revival and, and I was sitting on the airplane and I would tell you the absolute worst flight in America is between Augusta 
and Atlanta. I ride it so often. They normally give us these little small planes. It's just tiny. And I'm so used to that flight always being delayed. And just it was, just that morning, my flight was delayed. I'm sitting on the tarmac. And I'll admit to you, I'm sitting there thinking it's probably the usual. It's, it's a mechanical issue. They always give us the worst planes between Augusta and Atlanta. So I just knew that it was a mechanical issue. I knew it was a plane issue until the pilot came on the intercom. And he says, he says, I'm sorry, uh, we're experiencing delays. Uh, and the problem is we have fog on the runway. He said we have fog on the runway because we got fog on the runway. It is limiting our visibility. And since it's limiting our visibility, it does not allow us the opportunity to elevate to where we need to go. Because we can't see, we have to stay. And because our vision is hindered, we're stuck where we are. And hopefully over the next hour or so, the fog will lift. Because when we can see right, we can fly right. Y'all gonna catch this in a second. If I had time tonight, I would tell you that's what shouted me. Because in my mind, I'm having an issue. Because I go to Atlanta to connect to another place. Which means unless we get the right visibility, I'm gonna miss my connection to where God wants me to be. Bump that neighbor beside you and say, neighbor maybe that's why you stuck where you are is because your vision is too limited maybe that's why you are stuck on the level you are is because you can't see and until you can see right God can't take you where he wants you vision. See. so what is it what is it that he wants them to see what, what is it and he wants them to see a miracle but but notice Moses still has a problem. He has a sea they can't swim over. He, they don't have a boat. There's no yacht for them to ferry across. They don't have the ability to climb up the sides of the mountains. And, and if he didn't want them to go to Philistine territory because he knew they couldn't fight, surely God didn't want them to fight those behind them. So God, what do you want me to do? What am I to see? If I'm in a place where I seemingly have no options. He said, Moses, what you got in your hand? Got this staff, this, this thing I've been using since, since you sent me. He said, all right, lift your hands. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I know sometimes you, I know, I, I know sometimes in 21st century, uh, um, y'all want us to do gadgets and games and we have to do stuff to wow you, to show you God's amazing power. But the simple instruction that he gave Moses was the key to see God move. It was a simple lifting of the hands. <laughs> I know, I know you, you've, got, you've got people that tell you got to sow a certain number of seed and, and you got to do this and you got to do that. But the Bible says in very simple terms, I'm just reading the Bible, lift up your hands. And when he lifted up his hands, God started moving. Maybe if I told some of you, maybe that's the reason why you ain't been able to see God move is because you've been in a posture of, of not understanding that lifted up hands have a way of getting the attention of God, which means when I find myself in an impossible situation it's not my time to throw in the towel it's not my time to fret it's simply my time and my season to lift up holy hands I know that's not getting everybody excited but somebody in New Hope tonight can testify that something happens when you lift up your hands something takes place when you decide to lift up your hands because lifting up hands get the attention of God look at a neighbor beside you and say neighbor you better get your hands lifted because lifting up hands makes God start moving. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. And some of y'all don't even realize what your lifting of hands does. Because notice the text, this was not a solo isolated miracle that only Moses would experience. The crossing of the Red Sea was not just Moses going across, but it was the whole nation of Israel. Yes, sir. But the text says it was only Moses 
that lifted up his hands. Which means that when Moses lifted his hands, it didn't just affect him. But everybody he was connected to got to benefit from him lift, I see, that's why some of you don't understand. That's why you need to make sure when you come to church, you sit on the right pew because everybody don't want everybody to get delivered. But look up and put down your pew tonight and say, neighbor, when I lift up my hand, that's for all of us on this pew. When I lift up my hand, that's for my children and my child. I wish I had some people tonight that can lean over to somebody and say, neighbor, I'm lifting up my hands because I want everybody connected to me to get through it. This is for the soprano section. This is for the Auto section, this for the tip, touch somebody and tell them this for everybody. Lift up your hand. I'm a, that's it. I'm a, here it is. Here it is. Lifts up hands. And God, God, start doing stuff. The miracle was not just for Moses, but everybody he was connected to became a benefactor of the way he surrendered by lifting his hands. And I wish I could move on. That, that in itself is enough to shout us. But I realize my next point ain't going to make much of us shout. Because P, as I, much as I've read this text, something bothered me when I revisited it again. Because the text says, we know how the miracle took place. As a little boy, I know how God did. He blew on the water and the waters parted. And I would admit to you as a kid, my, my thought was it was an instantaneous miracle. That as soon as Moses lifted, God blew, they just walked across, and that was it. But read your Bible. The Bible says that when Moses lifted his hands, God blew on the water all night long. So what are you saying, Goodman? What I'm saying is that this was a miracle that took some time. And I know that's going to be hard for some of us to swallow in this culture today where you want a miracle right now. We live in fast food moments. We, we want instant rice. We, we want stuff now. We, we don't like to wait for anything. But what if I told you that some stuff God does is not going to be right now. And can you endure the process of seeing God blow on what you need to cross even if it takes all night? I wish I had. Okay, this ain't, this ain't for everybody. This is going to be for some maturing people here because if it was me, I know I would get sometimes antsy, but what I appreciate about God is God is so amazing that he allows me to see his beginning to the end, which means if he starts something, my job is to simply wait until he finishes. See, the problem with too many of us is we want to quit in the process, and I'm here to just encourage you, child of God, tonight, is that some stuff you just got to wait. I know you lifted your hands and it may not happen next week and it may not happen next month and it may not happen next year but somebody can testify he who hath begun a good he shall finish it touch somebody next to you as a neighbor see it all the way through learn how to keep praising him while he's still working that thing out don't quit now just because it ain't happened when you want it to happen but learn how to trust God I wish I had somebody in New Hope that can look over your life and say, now it makes sense because sometimes I just had to wait on oh God. I'm done. I'm done. I'm out. Yes, sir. He doesn't calm our fears. He doesn't control our focus. I'm done. Here's the final thing. He then finally yeah. makes us go through it. And I'm not saying miracle because number three, he wants to confirm our favor. Bible says that after a while, can you imagine that next morning, God's work was complete. The waters were parted. And the Bible says they crossed over to the other side on dry ground. Yeah. Um, um, they crossed over. All, all these people who were in a stuck, no-win situation now got to see a miracle of God. 
and now the waters are parted. And the Bible says they get to cross over on dry ground. They start progressing through the Red Sea. Uh, all these people are there. And it wasn't until they start moving because if you notice the tanks, they weren't the only one that were moving. Look at the tanks. While they were moving, God was moving. It's subtle, but it's huge. Because up until that moment, God was a cloud directing them. But as they moved through the Red Sea, watch the text, God moves from directing to defending. But they never would have seen God move if they wouldn't have moved. Um, sometimes, child of God, you waiting on God. But what if I told you, sometimes God is waiting. Y'all ain't going to help the preacher. And so now, as they're going through, God shifts position. But P, I am struggling tonight because I wonder, what is the significance of dry ground? I mean, I'm asking myself this question. Why is it so imperative? I mean, even if it was soaked, it was still a pathway. Why not just dry up the water? Why make sure that the ground is dry for them to cross over? Maybe there's a couple of options I would confer to you tonight. Maybe because he needed the ground to be stable for them to pursue all the way through because if the ground was unstable it would make the journey very difficult and I know I could sit there and saddle that all night but there's probably something a little more practical than that maybe God said goody the reason why I dried up the ground is because where I was taking them I didn't want them to drag mud from where they were to where they were going in other words I wanted to make sure that when they get through this they ain't gonna have nothing that reminds Reminded them of where they were so I don't want them dragging mud in the new season of stuff they had to deal with in the old I wish I had somebody tonight to lean over to a neighbor and say neighbor I don't look like what I've been through matter of fact check my feet baby I got some dry feet why because God wanted to make sure that I didn't take some stuff into my necks with what I'm dealing with now so he dried it up so that we could cross to the other side. I got to get out of here. May the Lord bless you real good. But that's not the real shout of favor. But the Bible says that when they made it to the other side, check what the Bible says. The Egyptian army decided to follow them through the Red Sea. They decided to do what Israel trained. They decided to take the same route that Israel did. But something happened when they tried to go through what Israel went through. The Bible says God let the waters come down it consumed their army and their bodies flew up on the shore see some of y'all don't know when to shout because you assume that favor is just cash clothes and cars that's not favor child of God if you really want to know what favor is favor is making it through something that others went through but did not survive in other words true favor from God is when you can look over your life and testify I should be dead and gone but I'm still here I gotta get out of here may the Lord bless you real good come on let's have a little church grab a neighbor by the hand tonight and say neighbor I got a word for you tonight you're shaking the hand of some of God's favor cause as I look back over my life I done been through some stuff I done been through some storms and I done been through some red seas but as I look back over my life I've made it others didn't make it but I'm here tonight and because I'm here tonight I'm going to celebrate the goodness of God goodbye new hope may the Lord bless you real good but grab that neighbor bow that hand one more time and shake that neighbor's hand like you know God is good Shake that neighbor's hand Like you know God made a way Shake that neighbor's hand And say neighbor I didn't like it But I got through it I didn't understand it But I'm still here If that's your testimony Open your mouth
and shout it out. Shout it out. Shout it out. Shout it out. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Shout it out. Tell them I made it, I made it, I made it. Tell them I made it, I made it. Tell them I made it, I made it. Tell them I made it, I made it. Shout it out. Won't go? Everyone standing, everyone standing. Play softly, hear me. Play softly, tell somebody, listen, I had to go through it. Tell them I had. I didn't understand it. I wish there was another way. But I had. If you trace the history of Israel from this point forward, parts, this is the pinnacle miracle. Whenever something happens in the history of Israel, he goes back and reminds them, I'm the God that brought you through the Red Sea. Jesus. When they were facing captivity and they were struggling, he said, I'm the God that brought you through the Red Sea. And the Red Sea was an unnecessary miracle. But it was needed for them to know who God is. Before you curse your Red Sea, you ought to shout over your Red Sea. Oh, I feel you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight. We bless you and we honor you. We glorify you tonight. Oh, God, we appreciate the simple fact that even in your incomprehensibility, we're still trying to figure you out. So even God, when you don't make sense, we still gonna trust you. Even when it don't always seem to go how we want it to go, we still gonna trust you tonight. Cause you know better than us what we can experience. And you know what's gonna bring us to a more closer relationship with you. So God, tonight I thank you that you don't tell me everything. Thank you, God. I thank you tonight, God, that you don't let me try to run everything over you. You, you know better than us. So tonight I thank you that shorter wasn't better tonight. I thank you that I learned how to keep my focus tonight. And Lord, I thank you that I survived what others didn't make it through tonight. Lord, I thank you. And until, God, you got my permission to keep doing what you do best. In Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen. Hope three or four people tell them I had to go through it. I had to go through it. Hallelujah.